principal submissions. I'll list them first, then develop them. The first is that the Bolex supply case lays down an unqualified rule to the effect that a court seized of a libel claim on a mosaic basis that cannot grant an internet injunction of any sort. Secondly, if I'm wrong about that, then at the very least, the Bolex case means that an English court seized on a mosaic basis that can only grant an internet injunction if, in both its terms and effect, the injunction is limited to England and Wales. And I'll be stressing that that is, in, in my submission, a question of jurisdiction, uh, not about the circumstances in which an acknowledged jurisdiction uh, should be exercised. And uh, thirdly, if either my first or second submission is correct, that there's no scope for reaching a different result but by appealing to fundamental rights under the ECHR or the EU Charter. Um, so turning to my first and, and principal submission, uh, which is that the Bowen Supply case lays down an unqualified rule. Uh, we, we say that the ratio of the Bowen Supply case is, is, is simple and clear, and it's in unqualified terms. A good starting point is the operative part of the judgment. Uh, that's in authorities bundle tab 13. That's the final page, page 400 in the bundle. Uh, this is, of course, where the court is answering the question and laying down the law as it sees it. Paragraph 2 of the operative part, Article 7.2, must be interpreted as meaning that a person who alleges that his personality rights have been infringed by the publication of incorrect information concerning him on the internet and by the failure to remove comments relating to him cannot bring an action for the extrication of that information and removal of those comments before the courts of each member state in which the information published on the internet is or was accessible. Um, the European Court has recently reiterated that uh, principle in exactly the same terms in the G2 Flix case that my learned friend showed you. That's at paragraph 33. And it's how it's been put in the three English decisions you've been shown. The Said case, Kennedy and the National Trust for Scotland case, and uh, NAPAG trading, or, or not, not citing the terms, endorses Said as a valuable summary of the law. Now, Ms. Skinner says that none of these cases involved a party seeking, in terms, an injunction prohibiting online publication only within a specified territory. And, and, and she's right about that, of course. But, so her case is, therefore, that the Bolas case can be distinguished or its ratio can be stated more narrowly. That, that's why she keeps adding the word at source into her formulation of the test. Uh, but the, the ratio of a case doesn't have to be stated in the narrowest possible terms to fit the facts. But whether the true ratio of a case is, is wider or narrower depends on many factors, including, um, at least in the case of interpreting EU legislation, uh, the extent to which the wider formulation of the ratio uh, promotes the purposes of the legislation. And uh, another factor to consider is the extent to which the court was alive possible factual distinctions in other cases, but nevertheless chose to state the principle in wide terms. And what I hope to demonstrate is that in laying down an unqualified rule, that the CGEU was best serving the purposes of the regulation, the dual principles of legal certainty and proximity. And secondly, that when it did so, it was very well aware that there might be circumstances in, in which a territorially limited internet injunction might be workable, but chose to lay down an unqualified rule in any event. So to develop the first of those points a little further, that's to say that uh, the, the, the wide unqualified principle that I invite you to take from BOLAG accords best with the, the purposes of the regulation. Um, the, 
explanation is at um, tab six in the authorities. And the objections I mentioned of, of need and certainty and proximity uh, can be seen in recitals 15 and 16, page 45 in the Umbra. Uh, so uh, recital 15 says the rules of jurisdiction should be highly predictable. And uh, found on the principle jurisdiction is generally based on the defendant's domicile. Jurisdiction should always be available on this ground, save in a few well defined situations. Uh, and then uh, recital 16, uh, which is more about the principle of proximity, says that in, in addition to the domicile case rule, Alternative grounds for jurisdiction based on the close connection between the court and the action in order to facilitate the sound administration of justice. And the existence of a close connection should ensure legal certainty and avoid the possibility of the defendant being sued in a court of a member state which he could not reasonably have foreseen. Uh, this is important, particularly in disputes concerning non contractual obligations arising out of violations of privacy, rights relations related to personality, including defamation. So the objective legal pr pr predictability that fully justifies a, a, a clear and unqualified approach uh, to the exceptional uh, jurisdiction under uh, Article 7.2, we say, a defendant needs to know in advance whether he faces the possibility of proceedings for an injunction in any particular state. And where the answer is... Uh, uh, Yes, you face such a threat either in your home state or in the state where the uh, claimant has a centre of interest. That, that is a clear and predictable test on which a defendant can take a view. Uh, but uh, what if the answer is, well, maybe. Uh, maybe you will face injunction claims in, 20, in the courts of 27 different member states. Uh, that doesn't promote legal certainty in my submission because uh, answering that question is contingent on factors that you can't really know at the point of a defendant would need to know whether putting material online would result in publication in that member state that's sufficient to justify an injunction. Well, and is that, how is that different from the damages jurisdiction? Um, it's different in the sense that uh, in a damages case, <coughs> one knows that if, if one's publications end up in particular member state, that uh, one is exposed to uh, damages limited to damages uh, for relating to publication in that jurisdiction, on which the court would take a conservative view if there was any doubt about it. Uh, that, that's a very different sort of uncertainty uh, compared to the uncertainty of whether a court would feel able to uh, um, entertain an injunction claim. Um, but that involves many more imponderables which I was coming on to, such as whether in a particular case there is available effective geo-blocking technology that can prevent publication in uh, that particular jurisdiction or not. Um, but that's something that the publisher will know. Yeah. The publishers, it's under the publisher's <coughs> control whether what their geo-blocking technology does. All they have to do is to interrogate the person who operates it all this stuff itself and say which, which of these countries do you, do you well, work in? Or, or, or what, a, what a court may make of that and whether the court may say well you may not be geo-blocking at the moment but there are other things out there you ought to be doing. Um, and I was going to add that um, media organisations that put material online do it not only through their own websites where they do have you might say a degree of control or foreknowledge but they do it via a number of different uh, channels and, and routes um, this case is an example of it. Uh, my, my clients not only have their own websites, but they, they have their uh, YouTube channel, they have uh, Twitter, other media organisations may have uh, Facebook channels, Instagram channels, etc. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the ability to keep that material out of a particular jurisdiction is contingent upon providers of those channels and what they can do to uh, comply with uh, a, a 
territorially limited order. So that, that it, it's in the nature of putting material on, on the internet um, that these, these matters are uncertain at the point that you put the material out there. Uh, and it is difficult to predict these days that whether in any particular case a, a court in a particular member state that would feel able to entertain a, uh, um, a, a, an injunction claim or not. Uh, and it's difficult for the expected defendant to know what they could do uh, to avoid that situation or indeed what they would have to do to comply with the injunction were it to be granted. Um, so, so, so that's why we say uh, a clear and absolute rule. There are two jurisdictions maximum to look at, your home state and the centre of interest state. It promotes legal certainty in a way that um, the, the possibility of mosaic injunction doesn't. Um, and, and we say that allowing injunctions on a mosaic basis really doesn't promote uh, the objective of proximity at all. Uh, that's demonstrated by this case, that, that the courts of England and Wales are not at all well placed to determine whether readers of material online uh, uh, should be deprived of uh, the opportunity to read future stories about uh, Signor Mincioni and the history of the proceedings against him in, in, in the Vatican. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I don't follow that. In the Mosaic claim, the Mosaic court is entitled, indeed bound, to take account uh, of the damage done by publication within that mosaic jurisdiction. Why is, it, why is there any less proximity if it's being asked to grant an injunction to prevent further publication within that mosaic jurisdiction? Well, it, it, because at that stage it would have to uh, conduct the balancing exercise that's necessary in every case where there is jurisdiction to grant an injunction. But, uh, and that's rather difficult for an English court to do when it's remote from the, the, the facts underlying the, the dispute. Uh, both the Signor Mincione's circumstances, and the centre of interest are here, uh, and the circumstances <coughs> about the story, which is all Vatican or, or Italy based. Uh, so, uh, Sorry, it's my fault. I, uh, ha, ha, what, what, what additional considerations arise in the context of an injunction in relation to future use from those which arise in relation to determining damages from sorry, future publication? But, but, but from perhaps, damages for past publication? But, but perhaps there's no no great difference between past and future. Uh, the reality is the mosaic basis is, is now something of an outlier in, in terms of the Article 7.2 jurisdiction because uh, the, the better way of promoting the objective of proximity is the centre of interest route that's been opened up since the Regate case. Well, that may be, but we're concerned to, to, to uh, determine the scope of the jurisdiction in mosaic claims. So. It doesn't help. It doesn't help us. To we, be told we are, that but it's, not, it's not very often invoked. No, but uh, the what I'm saying is that opening up a mosaic basis for um, injunctions doesn't promote the objective of proximity to any great extent. Or as I say, the reasons I've given, it, it does undermine uh, the uh, legal certainty aspect. Coming on to the, the, the second reason why I say a, a wide reading of the Bolex uh, case is, is, is appropriate, um, uh, and that is, is this. I say that um, the judgment is laconic, of course, as these judgments quite, quite often are from the CJE rule. Uh, uh, but in, in my submission, the court is clearly aware of the potential distinctions between um, Factual situations in which uh, um, an injunction might uh, have universal effect, and uh, a case in which it might have some more limited effect, and nevertheless goes for the uh, um, absolute hard and fast rule that in those circumstances is an internet injunction to be granted by the, the Mosaic Court. And to understand that, uh, I'd invite you to go back to the E date case and indeed the Advocate General's decision in the e-date case. Uh, because, uh, as I'll show you, uh, 
a, a lot of the thinking that's uh, developed by the Advocate General in his opinion is distilled into uh, um, the words in the Ede case, which are then carried forward into Bolex as well. Um, and, and just to clarify one thing uh, in response to my learned friend, I'm not placing reliance on the uh, Advocate General in the Bolex case itself, because I accept that the, the Advocate General there was advocating a solution that the court didn't eventually adopt. But the, the opinion I ask you to look at is, is that of the Advocate General in Ede, uh, which is adopted by uh, the court in Ede and then carries through, I say, into Bolag. So it helps the court understand uh, the use of certain phrases and terms in the Bolag judgment. Um, The Ede case is at uh, tab 10 in the authorities bundle. And part of the Advocate General's opinion, uh, I invite you to read, starts on page 215, paragraph 42. How far would you like us to read? Um, I'm, Can I just take you through it and, and um, highlight some particular points? Uh, this section is, is his discussion of um, the internet and how it differs from the printed press. Um, and at the end of paragraph 43, having noted some Speech of the internet. Uh, he says, the internet has transformed the temporal conception of those relationships because of the immediacy with which their content may be accessed, and because of their potential for permanency on the net. Once content is circulated on the net, it is in principle available via the net forever. <coughs> when they say in principle in these cases, it's not very easy to see what they're talking about because. Availability isn't a matter of principle, it's a matter of fact. Yes, well, what I'm going to be submitting is that the word in principle, which you'll see, eventually find their way into the E date judgment and then to the Bolex judgment, that means, in the vast majority of cases, what the, what the yes. Advocate General is doing here is trying to show the radical difference between, on the one hand, press. I think the they're probably using it in the French sense, aren't they, as a rule? Yes. Uh, as a general rule, yeah. is, is, is how it's being put forward. And so whenever that phrase or a similar phrase crops up, uh, what is being said that, uh, as a matter of generality, uh, this is what it's like publishing on the internet, and it's very different from publishing in hard copies. Uh, and the point I want to make is, is the court is very well aware that they're dealing in generalities here, and yet they... Uh, decide to lay down a universal rule rather than one that tries to distinguish between the general position and exceptions that may crop up from time to time. So that at paragraph 44, some important differences between the printed press and the internet are, are set out. And again, we have a similar point by little e on the page, the final sentence. Even media outlets on the internet which must be paid for are different from other forms of media because generally that the purchase is made on a worldwide basis. So an acknowledgement that there may be cases where uh, uh, some greater form of territorial restriction may be imposed. I'm so sorry, where, where are you now? So this is the final sentence of paragraph 44. Envisage permanent and universal access to the net. Uh, yes, it, 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 it's saying that the, most things from the net are universally accessible, and even if you try and restrict uh, in material on the internet with payment, then uh, usually uh, that will be uh, 
doesn't restrict the geographical access to the material, it just restricts it to people who pay to wear it at some point. Um, <coughs> over the page of paragraph 47, says further, the control exerted by a media outlet over distribution and access to its medium becomes blurred and on occasions unattainable. Um, uh, again, recognising there may be occasions when control over your material on the internet is attainable. But, but uh, he's talking in general terms here. Uh, and uh, he explains that that is because of the way that material is shared on the internet. And then uh, between D and E, an important sentence, even the restriction of content by means of paying access, which is occasionally subject to territorial limitations, but faces serious difficulties when it comes to preventing the mass distribution <coughs> of information. So, so that is a, a clear recognition, I say, uh, that the possibility of territorial limitation is, is, is there in the Advocate General and then in due course the Court of Mind. Uh, but the Advocate General's view is, is that uh, that is of such uncertain effect that in the great scheme of things it's impossible to have a rule that uh, tries to distinguish bet between a situation where there is territorial control and isn't. I if one wants legal certainty, one is necessarily <coughs> driven to having a, a, a universal rule uh, that, that doesn't require a priori investigation of whether a particular publication on the internet is going to be uh, territorially or not. Yeah, but that's not to do with control by the publisher, by the originating publisher. It, it's to do with overall control. Isn't it? Well, I mean, there's no problem. I mean, theoretically and in practice, if you're a, a publisher restricting um, access to paying subscribers, you can restrict access to paying subscribers. What you can't do in practice is to stop them forwarding it onwards by using electronic methods which achieve mass publication. Uh, yes, but that, that, that's a problem in this context because remember the injunction sought in this case is, is preventing us from publishing or causing to be published material. And at least on one view of the law, when third parties foreseeably republish your material, but one is liable for that. And, and there is a third party publication complained of in, in this case, in the claimant's case on, on serious harm by a blogger who simply uh, uh, copied and pasted uh, the second of the articles, the English article, and put it on his website. Uh, and that is a, a, a strong illustration of how once you put material out there, uh, you may still be liable for it, but you're no longer in, in control of it. But is that a difference of kind with print publishing, or it, maybe it, a difference of degree? Well, it, it, no, it, it's a difference of degree, but a massive dis difference of degree. I mean, Yes, if Francois in 1995 had realised it was saying something very defamatory about Mr. Cheval, so it decided to, to not send any copies over the channel that night. We're not going to publish, uh, we're not going to send our, our edition tonight to, to the UK. And yet someone buys a copy in Paris, takes it over on the boat and reads it in London. Well, in a sense, that's not foreseeable in the publication in, in London. But the difference of degree and, and is so great between that scenario and the scenario on the internet where instantaneously massive amounts of, of, of material that then are having to put out on their own website can be copied and pasted and circulated. And um, no, no defence would seriously say that's not a foreseeable consequence of putting things online. It's, it's exactly what happens wherever things go online. Uh, so it, it is a difference of degree, not of category, but it's uh, such a huge one that it deserves to be taken account of. Um, so, so what I say, the Advocate General here is recognising the possibility of some sort of control over material on the internet, including territorial control, but it's not a reliable possibility, it's not the sort of possibility that should be looked at when trying to formulate a rule that is sufficiently certain for defendants to clear by and, and regulate their conduct by. 
And it's that thinking which is then distilled into the very short paragraphs in the Edate judgment itself, the paragraphs 45 and 46. page 237 in the bundle, um, where the court accepts the placing of on online content on a website is to be distinguished from the regional distribution of media such as printed matter, in that it is intended in principle to ensure the ubiquity of that content, uh, that it may be consulted instantly by an unlimited number of users, in irrespective of any intention on the part of the person who placed it in regard to its consultation beyond that person's member state or establishment and outside of that person's control. And then we get another in principle in paragraph 46, that the internet reduces the usefulness of criteria in relation to distribution insofar as the scope of the distribution of content placed online is, in principle, universal. But moreover, it's not always possible on a technical level to quantify that distribution with certainty and accuracy in relation to a particular member state. And what we say is that that use of the word, of the words in principle, is, is really picking up on, on what the Attorney General is saying: is that uh, as as a general rule, uh, there is very little opportunity to reliably control material that is on the internet, uh, and, and that supports the uh, use of a when it comes to bolex supply. Those well, the term bolex supply now, um, but you'll see that those words in principle are, are picked up again, and we say to similar effect in the Bolex case. So if we can look back to Bolex again um, in authorities, chapter 13, and at paragraphs 46 and uh, 47 of the judgment. Rather, 48 is, is, is where the reasoning is given. However, in the light of the ubiquitous nature of the information and content placed online on a website, and the fact of <coughs> the scope of their distribution is, in principle, universal, the application to the rectification of the former and the removal of the latter is a single and indivisible application, uh, and can consequently only be made before the court with jurisdiction to rule on the entirety of an application. What we say that that means is the court is there recognizing that in general um, the ability to control a publication uh, on a territorial basis is, is very, very limited indeed. Uh, and that therefore that what is required is a hard and fast rule uh, that doesn't require uh, investigation into particular facts and circumstances uh, and that the claimant's interests are properly protected by allowing them to seek an injunction either in the defendant's home state or in their centre of interest state. Um, and uh, the point I made in my skeleton argument, if the, the court thought there was a meaningful distinction to be drawn, it could have sent, it could have identified that distinction and sent back uh, further factual matters for the court to consider. Estonian court to consider, as the, the CJE often does when it um, analyzes an issue and sees possible tax sensitive subdivisions within it. It's, it's um, very normal for it to send back a list of questions saying, This is our answer, and you now need to make findings about X, Y, and Z in order to reach a decision in your, your particular case. Uh, so it's, it's striking, we say, that the court didn't do that in this case. They didn't say, Well, uh, we see that there may be occasions on which appropriate for the court to grant a territorially limited injunction. But whether that is so or not depends on uh, the available technologies and, and how they might uh, affect this particular defendant, how the defendant might comply with such an order. Here is a list of questions, Estonian court, to help you uh, reach an answer on those. But they didn't do that. Uh, I've shown you the operative part of the judgment, and it's a completely unqualified term. 
And um, <clears throat> just to respond to Miss Skinner's point about the, the, the age of all this material, the Attorney General and the key date having, the Advocate General and the key date that having been writing in 2011, etc. Et, et the basic distinction the Advocate General was drawing between the controllability of material on the internet and uh, in hard copy that r remains true today, we say. Um, there may have been some technological advances, and but uh, the essence of the distinction remains a good one, we say. But, uh, and geo-blocking um, is not an entirely novel technology. There's an EU regulation dealing with geo-blocking. Might as well say it's, re it's relevant to this case, but that was um, promulgated in 2018, but so will have been in preparation for a long time before that, certainly while the Volux case was going through the courts. Uh, so it can't be said that this is all somehow antiquated, the internet's changed since then, uh, uh, um, <coughs> and that, um, it, it, this is no longer a, a, a sort of proper guide to how the matters ought to be approached. Um, I think that's what I need to say on my, my first submission. I don't need to respond on the Said case because, of course, if, if this court thinks that that's the formulation that uh, Mr. Justice Nicholl came up with in that case is wrong, then, then it, it can say so. Because it, 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 in my submission, it's um, plainly right. And it's notable that um, when faced with the BOLAG problem in that case, the claimants jumped the other way. They didn't say, all oh, right, we'll limit our relief to a territorially limited injunction. But they jumped the other way and said, oh, my centre of interest. But that's, that's an obvious, um, well, there, there could well be tactical considerations. Yeah, they could. I, they framed their case in a way that didn't tell you anything about the jurisdictional foundation on which they were relying yes. until um, at the hearing. Yes. Council well, decided or was instructed to, to advance it on the basis of a centre of interest, and that's the way it was decided. Um, now, quite how and why they came to that conclusion. Um, one doesn't know, but they started off looking for a, an unqualified injunction. Yes. So it made more sense to go for the, the obvious jurisdictional basis for an unqualified injunction. Yes, but perhaps so. But I, I, I don't make yeah. any great point no. about it because your, your lordships will, will consider Bolags and come to their own view on it. Um, can, I, can I then move to my second submission, which we get to if I'm wrong on my first submission? Uh, and that uh, is that at the very least the Bolas case means that a court sees on a mosaic basis has no jurisdiction to grant an inter injunction unless both in terms and effect it will be limited to England and Wales. Uh, and it's important that this is recognised as an argument about jurisdiction, not about how uh, the court should exercise a, a discretion. Uh, and that's a fundamental difference between my position and Miss Skinner's. Um, it, that, that's been my position throughout, and, and that's why I put in the respondent's notice to make it absolutely clear that I'm inviting the court to see this as a question of jurisdiction, not a question of the exercise of jurisdiction. And that, and that is, isn't it, a respondent's notice point? The judge really dealt with it as a matter of discretion rather than a matter of jurisdiction. Well, she. In, in, in the judgment, she, she, paragraph 34 of the judgment, she correctly sets out my case on this, which is put as a jurisdiction. <coughs> uh, but uh, certainly when she comes to decide it, uh, there are at least ambiguities in whether she's sticking with my case or this, this slips over into the, is this a case where the court could ever use its discretion? Um, so I, I wanted to make it absolutely clear with the respondent's notice uh, that, that, that I do say it's a question of jurisdiction. But Just looking, looking again at this, I mean, the, this section of her judgment, when she comes to decide it, is headed defendant's alternative approach, and that's a point in your favour. Yes. Um, but when she she uses slightly different language when she comes to actually express her conclusion. But she, she, she does. Um, yeah, in paragraph nine. Why do I say this point about the existence of jurisdiction rather than just the exercise of it? 
Well, because that's what the regulation is about. Uh, the regulation is a regulation that confers jurisdiction. And when you're in interpreting uh, Article 70, you're interpreting uh, what the court says about the existence of jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, moreover, finding jurisdiction to grant an injunction uh, that is ex expressed to be limited to a particular territory, regardless of whether it would in fact have an effect outside that territory, uh, offends against the very mischief that the Bolas case is, is addressing. Um, I'll quote if I may, my, my learned friend's skeleton argument, paragraph 36. She says, the fundamental point underpinning the decision in Bolas is that an order for rectification and or removal of material online would result in a claimant obtaining more by way of final remedy than he would otherwise be entitled to in proceedings where he had brought a claim limited only to publication in the place where the harmful event occurred. To, to which we say, exactly. Uh, and uh, an injunction that is expressed to be limited to England and Wales, but in fact has ramifications going beyond uh, the borders of England and Wales, would, would offend exactly against that uh, identified problem. It would be getting more by way of final remedy uh, than the claimant is entitled to, having decided to bring the claim on a mosaic basis. Um, so the question as it arises in this case, we say, is this. Does the claimant have a good arguable case uh, that an injunction expressed to be limited to England and Wales uh, would in fact have no ability, no effect on the ability of readers outside England and Wales to access the articles and future content about Seaman and Tierney, uh, otherwise perhaps than in a de minimis sense? Uh, and the answer to that question is no, the claimant doesn't have such a good arguable case. Uh, because there's uncontested evidence that an injunction in the terms sought by the claimant would inevitably affect the defendant's ability to publish elsewhere, at the very least in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, that, that is the judge's finding at uh, paragraph 98 of the judgment. worth just looking at what the judge uh, finds at that par paragraph of the judgment. It's tab 8 in the core bundle. She says, in the light of the evidence of Mr. Bayes, which is not in dispute, it's clear the claimants are asking for a an injunction against the defendant in relation to online publication, which will inevitably take effect outside England and Wales. Uh, that's because undisputed evidence is that geoblocking can only be done at a UK level, and the removal of YouTube video can also only be done at a UK level. Uh, and uh, those two findings, she says, are, uh, are sufficient to uh, dispose of the point. And Ms. Skinner doesn't. Uh, um, dispute the finding about YouTube, uh, she does dispute uh, the finding about uh, geo-blocking only being available on a UK-wide level, uh, but we say she, she's wrong to do so, and that this is a, a correct finding by the judge. Her, her point is, is that Mr. Bayes uh, only addressed one particular provider of uh, geo-blocking uh, services in, in his witness statement rather than having a comprehensive survey of all geo-blocking facilities. Um, but it's important to understand how this came about. It, it started in correspondence. If you look at the um, supplemental bundle at tab 17, This is a letter from the claimant solicitors uh, responding when the defendants had raised this question about the, the uh, availability of the injunction. And on page 130, the second page of this letter, a number of 
questions are asked. Do any of the websites currently use geoblocking? Uh, do they use geoblocking to identify users based in England, for example, to display adverts? And thirdly, if the websites don't currently use but utilize geoblocking, does your client contend there is any technical or commercial impediment to it doing so? Please, if so, please set out the details. But, but well, that was answered in, in correspondence, and then the same answer was replicated in Mr. Bay's witness statement. But perhaps let's have one in this bundle. Paragraph 50. Paragraph 50 explains that uh, the defendants have uh, identified uh, a, a service, Amazon's AWS, uh, which does offer geo blocking. It, it explains something, something about the cost, uh, that's not relevant today. And it ends up by saying AWS WF would not permit geo blocking to be limited to IP addresses in England and Wales. Its effect would be to disable access to an article for all IP addresses in the UK. Um, and then the point is made again, paragraph 52, that if geoblocking were in, uh, implemented, this would block access in the UK as a whole, not England and Wales, and it would be open to be, be, to being bypassed. Uh, Ms. Sander's response to that in her witness statement, which is at tab 10 in the bundle, Starting at uh, paragraph 56, where she sets out the questions that I've just shown you. And at paragraph 58, she responds to what Mr. Bayes has said about the cost of using AWS WAF, but she doesn't dispute but what is being said there about the limitations of this geo-blocking service. Paragraph 59, again, it's all about the price of implementing this service, not about its technical limitations. But then at paragraph 60, she points to something that she's found on the defendant's website, um, which she says, or she appears to indicate, might suggest the defendant has greater technical ability to geo-block than it's letting on. Um, but you can see what she's referring to if you click on to tab 24. The page on the website um, she's referring to is about Grupo Jedi. Sorry, page you on? Well, on tab 24, uh, the website printout starts on page 160. Thank you. And uh, the, the page I'm referring you to is page 161, which is headed advertising. And it says Amanzoni and Co. is the exclusive advertising agency for the Jedi Group, which is a qualified group of third party Italian. Internationally publishers. And then in the final paragraph, it says uh, it has various data platforms that allow Manzoni to reach specific targets based on socio demographic information, interests, and geographical areas. But well, it, it, it's plain and obvious that this has nothing to do with geo blocking, this has to do with targeted advertising, which is the sort of thing where when you use the internet, you're interests from Google searches and so on is ascertained. Maybe your physical location is ascertained from your mobile phone's GPS data. And then a lot of uh, adverts pop up on the sidebar, directing you to taxi firms in Basingstoke or whatever it might be, depending on who they think you are and, and where you they think you might be. It, it doesn't imply any capacity to uh, geo-block in the sense of restrict access to a website on a geographical basis. Could be relevant, I suppose, in the context of a Section 12 also, which is push, push notification. Uh, 
very... Again, we're in the realms of speculation here because it wasn't, it wasn't the, the topic of here. This was just a direct bit. So it, 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 it's not. Um, one simply can't say whether this organisation could identify breeders un otherwise unknown to the defendant in this jurisdiction and, and push an apology that their way, for example. One can't say anything about that. But the point I'm making is this is, this is Miss Sala's opportunity to come back at what Mr. Bayes has said about geoblocking. And she doesn't do so on his fundamental point, which is the only service he's come across, that doesn't offer geoblocking on an England and Wales basis. But uh, this thing about the Manzoni Advertising Agency is a red herring. Um, what we say is that in the face of the evidence that Mr. Bayes has put forward, the claimant to show a good argu arguable case that geoblocking can be limited to England and Wales, the claimant would at least have to identify some product that does offer this, or at least purports to offer this. Uh, uh, and there's no evidence at all to that effect. So we say... Um, the judge was entirely right to make the findings she made, paragraph 98 of the judgment, that on uncontested evidence, geoblocking that operates at a UK level only, not an England and Wales level. As I've said, the evidence about YouTube is also un uncontradicted. That could only be controlled at a UK level. And although it's not mentioned in the judgment, the evidence about uh, Twitter is uncontested. Uh, the evidence is that uh, Mr. Bayes is that the journalists used Twitter uh, to promote their articles uh, with snippets of headlines, etc., links to the articles, uh, and that both the newspapers concerned have Twitter accounts, which are equivalent of 3 million followers. And uh, Twitter doesn't allow any geographical limitation, not even uh, UK-only limitation, on uh, text-based tweets. Uh, all Miss Sanders says about that is, well, that, that's no real concern, because on this particular occasion, the journalist didn't include defamatory matter in a tweet. All they did was um, publicise links to it. Uh, so that's the wrong way to look at it. We're looking at uh, an order that may stop a... Uh, a Republican journalist in future uh, uh, writing something in a tweet about Simi Mincioni that covers the same ground as these articles. But if this injunction is granted, they couldn't do that anywhere in the world. They simply couldn't put out a tweet. So, faced with that, all, all the claimant can really say is, is that the impact on publication outside UK, outside England and Wales, would not be just so small as to be uh, not a concern in proportionality grounds, because that's to follow the fallacy of Miss Skinner and think of this as a question about discretionary exercise of jurisdiction. But they have to go further and they say that interference with publication outside England and Wales would be so slight as to be deemed de minimis. Obviously, the de minimis rule always applies, and if um, there was some absolutely remote theoretical possibility of something being published, that something outside England and Wales being caught by this injunction, well, that perhaps could be ignored on the question of whether there's jurisdiction. Uh, but I can demonstrate that uh, the interference would be uh, far more than de minimis. Uh, to do that, uh, we need to understand how the defendant makes its material available online. Many, many various ways in which it does that. Um, I, I cover this in my skeleton argument at paragraph 45, and um, there are footnotes to all the re relevant passages of the witness statements that support these propositions. So I don't think I need to take you through the evidence in detail. None of this is contested. Uh, but the first way the defendant makes its material available online is on an open access basis on its own website. Uh, it, it, it's got four websites uh, relevant for these purposes. Uh, Reprepublica.it, 
that that's where Fitz La Repubblica stories are put online. And about 30% of the stories there are on an open access basis. So article 2, the English article, is such an article. Uh, then there's the Rep TV website where uh, a Republic of Journalists puts up uh, related video material. And the first video appears on that website. Then there's a searchable online archive website called Richer Car. That carries copies of the La Republica articles that have appeared in the hard copy edition. And the first article is available there on an open access basis. And then uh, lastly, uh, espresso.republica.it is the website for Nespresso articles. And uh, the current position is that about 30% of the stories that are posted there are there on an open access basis. Article 3, complained of in this case, is there on an open access basis. Pausing there, can you say that blocking the open access sites that I've just mentioned for the whole of the UK would only have a de minimis effect on readers in Scotland and Northern Ireland? But well, we don't have figures for individual readers in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but for the good reason that the internet seems to work on a UK only basis only. But one can draw inferences. Uh, article 1 was a subscription only article. So that non-subscribers who tried to access it on the open access website could only see the headline and the first few lines. Uh, but Mr. Bayes says that uh, 2,457 viewers from somewhere in the UK had tried to access that story uh, by December 2020. But that shows a, a very high level of interest in the story in the UK, Bayes said. Um, another nine UK readers accessed it on the archive site, which I cut. Article 2 uh, received 916 visits from the UK. Article 3 received 126 visits. Article 4, uh, again a, 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 a subscriber only one, but 96 attempts were made to access it in the UK. Uh, video number 1 on the Rep TV website received 467 views. Uh, so putting that all together, a, a total of 4,071 UK readers had accessed or tried to access the stories on the Defenders Open Access websites by the time this evidence was prepared, which was then back in uh, February this year, last year. Uh, and we say that's indicative of the likely interest in future stories about senior Mintieri. Can you assume that only a negligible proportion of those readers were in Scotland or Northern Ireland? We say no probably take judicial notice of the fact that there are significant Catholic populations in Scotland and Northern Ireland, significant populations of Italian descent in Scotland, significant commercial communities in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Belfast, uh, and of course the defendant publishes some of its material in English, so it's likely to pop up on uh, English search engines. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about this at the end of my submissions, uh, the story Concerning Simeon Mincioni has only grown in, in interest over the intervening time. It's likely to continue to, to attract great interest uh, from those parts of the UK population. So we say the defendant cannot possibly say that an injunction would only have an extraterritorial effect to a de minimis extent in that respect. Moving on to other ways in which the defendant makes its material available online. Uh, some of it is available to subscribers, either on the website or via a digital edition. Uh, the evidence is that uh, there are subscribers in the UK, in Mr. Bay's words, mostly but not exclusively in England and Wales. But the actual numbers of subscribers in Scotland or Northern Ireland are, are not in evidence, but it wouldn't be right for me to invite you to infer that they are a substantial number, uh, uh, so perhaps that doesn't add very much. Moving on to the next way in which uh, the material is made available online by the defendant is via its YouTube channel. 
that that has 551,000 subscribers or followers worldwide, that the number in the UK isn't stated, but video two, which appeared on that website, that received 792 views from somewhere in the UK. Uh, then uh, Twitter, as I've mentioned, La Repubblica has 3 million Twitter followers, and Espresso has 545,000 Twitter followers. And as I've already explained, journalists use that, those Twitter accounts to uh, um, publicize the stories in, in, in the main paper. And there are no geographical limitations on where tweets are read. And so if I could draw the threads together, this is a story of interest to readers throughout the UK and the wider world. An injunction expressed to be limited to England and Wales would at the very least require the defendant to cut off uh, access to the, these stories to its readers in the rest of the UK. It would require defendant journalists to desist from tweeting at the allegations altogether. And we say in those circumstances it's impossible to conclude that an injunction expressed to be limited to England and Wales would have no more than a de minimis impact outside England and Wales. Can I move on now to my third submission, which is the submission about convention rights? But, um, my point, as you know, is, is that if the Bolag supply case says either of the things I say it means in either my first or second submission, well, that's the end of it. And it's not uh, possible to reach a different result uh, by appealing to convention rights. Um, I'll take you through the nuts and bolts of that argument in, in a moment. Uh, but I, I don't want to be seen to be being uh, dismissive of the comments after late rights, uh, assuming they're engaged in this case. It, it, it's important to recognize that fundamental rights are are baked into the regulation itself and the case law on it. Um, if you look at the uh, recital 38, which is on that extra sheet I handed up uh, earlier on, <coughs> have six in the authorities. You'll see that, after that recital 38 says in terms, this regulation respects fundamental rights and observes the principles recognized in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, a particular right to an effective remedy and to a fair trial. And, and that's carried through in the case law as well. The, the, the whole development of the centre of interests that limb of Article 7.2 is done in order to ensure proper effective enjoyment by a claimant of their Article 8 rights by making sure that they can be considered in the court at which knows that person best and where uh, the impact on them can be best assessed. But now to explain why one can't reintroduce convention rights once one has Establish what Bolex supply means uh, to arrive at a different conclusion. Um, and this is set out in my uh, supplemental skeleton. I'm, I'm grateful for the permission to rely on this. I hope it's um, of more use than the uh, exposition I gave this subject in my main skeleton. Um, that sets out all the relevant statutory provisions. I'm not going to take you through it blow by blow, but the, uh, the position is, is this, it's as it was before Brexit, in that EU law uh, trumps domestic law in this case, and that when interpreting EU law, the English court must follow and apply any relevant decision of the CJEU. Uh, so the decision in Bolag Supply, that whatever you decide it to be, it is binding on this court, and uh, if it has the meaning I say it does, there are, there are no further arguments. And, um, is, that, is that right? It, I thought that this court, although not a first instance court, could depart from it in the same circumstances in which the Supreme Court 
put as a matter of precedent apart from its own decision? I believe it's only the Supreme Court that can under the EU legislation. It's Section 6.4 of the Withdrawal Act, which is at tab 3 in the authorities. Page 24 in the authorities bundle. For a Supreme Court, for B, High Court of Justice, for a sitting as a court of appeal. I take that to be Scotland, not the Supreme Court. Certainly lots of reference to Scotland Act. Ah, yes. You may be right about that. That was my understanding of it. Yes, I think that would make more sense. I think the position my Lord is referring to may be the position under 6.1a. But it doesn't matter because we're not, whatever it is, it's not the one. Yes, that's the position in respect to later cases. If you've got some retained EU law and there's a later decision of CJE. So you're not bound by GT Fix, for example. No. But you are bound by BOLAC because it's a pre- Yes, I'm sorry. And that's why Ms. Skinner's submission about Section 3 of the Human Rights Act doesn't work. She's saying that Section 3 requires you to adopt a strained, if necessary, interpretation of Regulation 7.2 and that the court didn't do that in this case. But it doesn't because Section 3 says so far as possible and is not possible for you to go back to 7.2 itself and undertake the interpretive process there because CJE has already spoken, she says. And it is that interpretation of CJE which is binding upon you just as if the Supreme Court had ruled on a particular statutory provision. This court would be bound to follow and apply that. And it also neatly addresses the article, the Section 6 point. The court is not breaching its obligation not to act incompatibly with the convention rights of the claimants because it is required to act in the way it does. So Section 6.2 applies. So the only way in which this court would need to consider convention rights is if you were to find that the Boehner Supply case says nothing at all on this topic of where the jurisdiction lies. If you were to really conclude that BOLAG simply doesn't address the position in which a claimant seeks a territorially limited injunction, then in that circumstance this would be virgin territory for yourselves and you could look at sections, look at Regulation 7.2 and adopt a convention compliant interpretation of it without coming up against the rule of supremacy of EU law because it would simply be a matter of not ruling on it. It may be a matter of going further back, mind you. What about Chevron? We're bound by that, I think. Yes, you're bound by that. Whatever Chevron means. Whatever Chevron means, yes. In the present context. And one view is that Chevron follows inevitably from Chevron that an application for relief going beyond damages is constrained by the territorial limits of the jurisdiction of the court that sees the claim. The Mosaic Court can't grant an injunction that goes beyond it. Yes. That was the case then. BOLAG's interpretation of the Act is not 
changed it. Nothing changed it. That must be right. So the scope for this court adopting its own human rights review of Article 72, we say, is non-existent. Nevertheless, though, if I could pick up on a point that my Lord Lord Justice Popper was making, even if convention rights do come into play, they come into play at the level level of deciding the rules of allocation, uh, not in some other uh, proportionality test. Uh, And the question would be on a human rights challenge, is there an uh, impermissible infringement of the Article 8 rights of the claimant? He's told that he can't get an injunction here, given that he could certainly get an injunction global effect in Italy and possibly in some other territory where his centre of interest is. We say that's a, a, a negligible. Well, we, we, don't, we don't in fact have any evidence about that, do we? About where his centre of interest is? No, about what, what, what relief would be available in Italy. Well, you can tell what relief would be available in Italy by uh, reading Bolax. It will be a claim brought in the defendant's home state and, and the European case law, including Bolax, says that the court seized on that basis must grant the claimant a, a global injunction. D- depending on well, the depending on on domestic law. Domestic law, is my point. Um. <coughs> I mean, you, you, you are able to say that uh, global relief is available in a global jurisdiction and it has not been suggested uh, or any evidence put forward in support of it. Yes, that may be the that same. Global relief is not available either in the centre of interest location, wherever that may be, or in your client's place of domicile, Italy. <coughs> but I'm not sure we have any any evidence on that. No, you're, you're, you're right. But that, that formulation uh, it, it, it is right. There is no evidence about uh, There's no, nothing to suggest that global relief is not available somewhere for this claim. Uh, whereas um, allowing injunctions on mosaic basis, we say, Substantial capacity to create a chilling effect on the defendant who has to make fine calculations about what any one particular jurisdiction might do and how that might affect what they do in some other jurisdiction. Um, so those are my submissions. If, if I may, can I just <coughs> spend a moment or two explaining why this, this point matters in this case? It may have crossed your mind. Um, this is an important story that uh, the the defendants are seeking to cover. It concerns allegations of large-scale corruption going to the heart of the Vatican and benefiting uh, people, including allegedly Sassoni Mincioni, to the tunes of many millions. And uh, since these articles and videos were published, matters have moved on. A number of defendants have been charged with embezzlement, uh, fraud, and money laundering including Senior Mincioni. Uh, the uh, prosecutors in the Vatican have produced a 487-page document, which is part indictment, part prosecution opening, and supplemented that with, a long, uh, with a, uh, another long document earlier this year. Uh, the, the trial is, is, is running. Preliminary objections by the defence have been dismissed. And Senior Mincioni, I'm instructed, is due to appear in court in the Vatican for questioning on the 6th of May. It, it's a matter of great interest in the Italian press. And the defendant wants to be able to cover this uh, story as it develops in the normal way, without having to tip, uh, tiptoe around an English injunction, without having to introduce expensive geo blocking facility, or, or having to uh, consider every time it puts something out on the internet, whether it's um, at risk of seeping into England. In Wales in breach of an injunction. <coughs> and the only way the English court uh, can stop the defendant covering this story is, is by an injunction in this case. Uh, future articles couldn't be sued on here, whether they're to the same effect as earlier articles or uh, uh, making new allegations, because uh, Section 9 of the Defamation Act will apply uh, going on. There's no prospect of this claim showing that of all the places where defendants' articles are published, England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate place for a trial. The the, the regime governing this court's jurisdiction (coughs) over uh, defendants in Italy and other member states has changed.
changed at the end of the transition period. Uh, and we're only here today because uh, proceedings were issued before the end of the transition period. So I, I, I make no criticism of the, the claimant for uh, taking advantage of that. Presumably he sees legal and technical advantages in bringing the claim in England under that old regime. Uh, but it's important that from this defendant's point of view uh, that it uh, should be free uh, to continue to cover this story uh, without having to, uh, as I say, tiptoe around uh, an English injunction uh, if there is indeed, as we say, no jurisdiction to grant it. And it's important to know now uh, because the defendant is entitled to know what is at stake in this uh, litigation. Um, you'll have noticed that uh, below there was a dispute about whether this was a properly a party level challenge that needed to be decided now or not. But the judge decided it was a proper jurisdiction challenge that needed to be decided at this stage on the evidence available. Uh, and uh, there's been no appeal against that. But unless I can assist uh, further, those are my submissions. My Lords, I think I have five points by uh, short points by way of reply. Um, dealing with um, Mr. Erdley's last point first, the why it matters uh, point, um, I, I have to say that if uh, we had known that he was going to be giving evidence to this court as to the current state of affairs and the defendant's intentions and what matters to the defendant and so on. Um, I would, by way of opening, have said something about that um, to make it absolutely clear um, to this court that um, the allegations um, against my client are completely denied, and he continues to deny them. Uh, and of course, that is why he has um, brought these uh, proceedings. Um, the obvious uh, repost uh, is that if the defendant wishes um, to continue to report on these proceedings, this is not an application for interim injunctive relief. It just it can defend the claim, and if it is right, and if it is a public, if there is a public interest uh, defence to its publications, that will be made out. The claimant will lose, um, and there won't be an injunction. An, an injunction will only arise if a public interest defence fails because the defendant has failed to take, uh, uh, has failed to uh, behave uh, reasonably uh, in publishing. Uh, so we have to bear in mind in my submissions um, those important fundamental points. Um, centre of interest, uh, it is uh, in my submission just worth noting, uh, and I was trying to turn up the reference, I think it's NAPAD, uh, where the point is made that it is, of course, the centre of interest is a basis on which a claimant can bring a claim. But it's not suggested that there is always one, that there is always one in existence. Uh, so there is the centre of interest. It's not possible to have more than one centre of interest, but it is possible to have no centre of interest. Um, and that has been recognised by um, the English court. Does your client have a centre of interest? Uh, I, I have, I, this court, I mean, I have no instructions on that. Um, so I, I'm unable to say, and there's no evidence going one way or the other about his centre of interest. Um, I have spent some time at the beginning um, indicating the extent of his connection with this um, country and the importance of his reputation to it. Uh, but that's as far as I'm able to take it. I certainly don't make this as a centre of interest um, case. No. Um, in relation, um, my Lord, to the Section 12, the position in relation to the um, Section 12 order, um, dealing first with the um, question that arose just before lunch in relation to, well, how, how might that be dealt with? Um, my Lord, it's, we submit that it could be dealt with in this way, um, that a statement could be published, ordered to be published on the defendant's website, um, saying words to the effect of, um, pursuant to Section 12 of the, De the Defamation Act 2013, um, the High Court of England and Wales has ordered the publication for the attention of readers in England and Wales only of the following summary of the judgment entered on whatever the date is, uh, and then the text of the summary. Or there could be um, 
simply a link that says announcement of outcome um, of judgment for readers in England and Wales. So there's not even any, so that, that is it. Uh, and it then contains a link. And so only it is targeted at readers in England and Wales and only they will look at it. Um, another way um, of um, achieving a similar result in my submission um, is to use the push notification um, facility that appears to exist in relation to targeted advertising. Uh, and the Section 12 summary um, could be ordered to be published in that way. So in the same way that the, the, the targeted advertising geolocates users and pushes relevant adverts out to it, out to them, uh, it could geolocate um, relevant uh, persons in England and Wales and um, send the judgment in the form of an ad, almost as an ad, for advertisement to them. Okay, so those would be two ways in which the Section 12 order could be dealt with in a way that is different um, from the position in relation to um, the restraining um, relief in the event um, that the court is against me on that. Um, it's, if like, uh, uh, it's my fault. I wasn't um, totally concentrating when you made the first point. What's the first two different ways? So, so those, so those were um, building on um, my lord's suggestion just before lunch about how how that could be done in a way which ensured that it was only directed to the attention of yeah. um, persons in England and Wales. It just says so. And, and that basically it, it is uh, either, either simply say it either says th this judgment is for the attention of readers in England and Wales only, or as an alternative, there's a link which says there is something behind this link in the link for the attention of readers in England and Wales only. Yes, I mean, um, in relation to scope of injunctive relief, um, at the moment, um, all that would be permitted by way of um, injunctive relief um, is in relation to circulation of hard copies within the jurisdiction, printed copies. Um, in my submission, <coughs> there is no reason to principle, um, if, if the concern is about extraterritoriality, so, so if, if, you, if, you do not, if you don't accept my, um, my primary submission on this, um, if there's no jurisdiction because of inevitable extraterritoriality, um, there is, in my submission, no bar in principle to an order restraining um, publication of such stories in the digital edition sent to subscribers here. Um, now, the way um, that that was addressed by my learned um, friend below was that, well, the digital edition is a carbon copy, essentially, of the print edition, so we'd have, you know, it wasn't said, but the um, inference would be, well, we'd have to then change it a bit before we send it out to subscribers in England and Wales. Um, well, in my submission, that, that wouldn't be any great hardship um, in order to be able to comply with the jurisdiction, and, and there would be, um, and we're going to not infringe um, against any... Um, extraterritoriality ter thing. Um, in Mr. Bay's statement, um, and I'm looking now, so this is at tab one of the supplemental bundle, at page 12, paragraph 48. So I should say it begins actually on page 11. And he says, he wrote to Withers, uh, explaining the defendant's position on the injunction question, answering the questions that Withers, 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 Withers had asked. Uh, in that letter, I stated that the defendant was not able, reliably, to ascertain the location of its subscribers. This was my understanding at the time, but it has since been explained to me that information about the location of subscribers is held by the defendant, and I have included this above. Um, now, my lord, we have checked above, um, and it isn't broken down by England, Wales, Scotland. Um, but that, in my submission, strongly suggests that, um, as a matter of fact, 
the defendant is able to locate subscribers um, and that it's not by reference to UK only. Because it's a reliable location. Uh, yes, I have my attention drawn to paragraph 13 of that statement, page 4. This is the rep subscribers. Digital edition. <coughs> of Publica. Uh, and you'll see there, my, my lords, that there's a reference at the end. Total of UK subscribers represent around 1% of all subscribers worldwide. The UK subscribers are located mostly but not exclusively in England. So in terms of subscribers to the digital edition, it would be possible to identify those in England uh, and ensure that the injunction is adhered to in relation to them. By well, effectively deleting the story from what would otherwise be the entire content. <laughs> So that um, deals with the position in relation to the digital edition. Um, my Lord, it would of course also be po uh, possible, and I, and I touched on this in my submission earlier, um, to, if, if the court um, took the view that this was a way of avoiding extraterritorial effect, um, to carve out, for example, Twitter publications. They don't have to be included in the restraining order if including them <coughs> um, would offend against extraterritoriality. Once Twitter is taken out, um, then in my submission, it really is all about Twitter. The submissions we've heard about this have been about Twitter and about YouTube. If those were taken out of consideration, then in reality, where we end up um, is the de minimis argument. This is a bit of a departure from the, uh, the way the case was run before the judge. Um, but it's a new point, isn't it? Yes, well, I mean, yeah, yes. <laughs> he, sa he said you haven't got a de minimis case, and you didn't until just now. Uh, well... <laughs> I see, was a, I see, I see, a submission too far. I, I see the force of it, um, <laughs> but um, I've made it. I've, I've said it now, so um, <laughs> I will not say any more. Um, what about publication on the open access? I, I'm sorry. I think what I about publication to non-subscribers on an open access basis? Which Mr. Erdi has told us was how amounts to about 30% and was how uh, at least one of the articles was published in this case. Do you, do you, do you mean in relation to the de minimis argument? No, I mean, well, I mean in relation to your, your new argument that by reference to the location of subscribers you could uh, treat the injunction as capable of being confined to this jurisdiction. Well, that, uh, that may, I mean, I... That could be done with the. I mean, that. Well, that's the problem. We don't really. The evidential position on this is not. It isn't clear. But if you're able to send push no notifications out based on geolocation, then. That. that well, that's a different possible. point from your subscribers' point. Yes. Sorry, bear with me a moment. We, we don't we don't have um, anything that specifically suggests that we can break down location um, by 
reference to England alone, other than in relation to the subscribers. Just to be clear about that. I don't want to lead anyone any more astray than My Lord, unless I can assist any further, I feel I need to get my way. Could you just give us a moment? I just raise a point because um, the point that my Lord made about the impact of uh, retained EU case law yes. sparked a memory of another case in which um, we were treated to <coughs> helpful um, submissions about the effect of the regulation. saying one way or the other whether any of this applies. I don't think anyone submitted that we're bound by any uh, post-IT completion date domestic authority, um, but this suggests that if it applies, it might, the position might be a little less um, rigid than Mr. Hurdley uh, was submitting. Yes, it does. I'm grateful for that, and I'm sorry it wasn't addressed head on. Um, If, it's, okay. if your lordship has read out, so it suggests there is, in principle, a, a opportunity for this court to depart from the Foreign Act and a very limited opportunity on the basis of the 1966 practice direction. We would say, therefore, no, any, no impediment to that. Well, if, 
is the best thing to give you an opportunity to, to, to ask uh, and um, within let's say by close of day tomorrow on each side if you wish to put in any further written submissions you want to and that would be useful. The case in which it came up just in case um, that's of help it's a case called, called Open Rights my feet, could, could I just direct you to some evidence about the digital edition which was brought up by Ms. Skinner and, and Brian Scott previously. Um, in Mr. Bay's witness statement, um, Supplemental Bundle, tab 1, page 3, paragraph 11, that the digital edition of La Repubblica was explained. It explains it's available only to subscribers who can access it online or download it through a device they can get the current edition and 20 previous editions. No geographic limitation on where they may subscribe from or where they may access it. Um, it in, in light of that, if, if you accept my principal submission that there's no jurisdiction to grant any sort of limited injunction, then the, the, that would be true for online access to the digital edition as well. Um, if you're against me on that, accept my second submission that there is scope for an injunction that's limited in terms and effect in many ways, but then yes, you should have, have an injunction, uh, the effect of which is to require um, the digital edition to be withheld, or the, the particular story in the digital edition to be withheld from particular subscribers in England and Wales. Um, the and, 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 and on the evidence that is practical. Well, uh, the evidence is, is everything you've seen, and I can't add to it, but Mr. Bay's statement it indicates strongly that there is an ability to identify subscribers within England and Wales, as opposed to just the UK. No, and there's no reason to think that there'd be any technological difficulty in sending to subscribers in England and Wales who are capable of identification uh, the entire uh, print copy, but with the relevant story deleted. Well, well it, 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 it may be tremendously inconvenient and expensive, but those would be arguments to run at the time of, of trial, not, not now. Um, I, I should add that the, the, the articles currently subject to debate aren't in, available on the digital edition anymore because they drop off after 20 editions. Um, uh, the digital edition of L'Espresso is dealt with in paragraph 20, essentially the same thing. Well, we're, not, um, we're, we're only concerned, aren't we, with future with publications? Future publications. Thank you both very much. Um, we'll uh, take time to consider our judgments. They'll be handed down in draft in the usual way, as you know, for <coughs> editorial corrections only, not re-arguing the case. Uh, and then they'll be uh, handed down, uh, whether remotely or by uh, one of the constitution in person, there'll be no need for attendance on that occasion. Uh, we'd invite you, when you've seen the draft, to agree uh, consequential orders. If you can't agree, put your arrival submissions in writing, and we will decide them on paper. <coughs> Thank you both very much, and indeed those behind you.